pressing me now. Really? You see, you've lost me. I was with you at the beginning, but not now. I'm a little disappointed. Sorry. You really think that? You thought it over, came to an opinion, and you believe that? It is popular. Well, so is body piercing, but that isn't a good thing, is it? I suppose. So let's look at the facts. A single man lives in a castle in the middle of... Where's it set again? Film or book. There's a difference. Both films change some details. It doesn't really matter. Well, in the books, it's set where it's set. And this man lives in this big house in the middle of town. And he lives with dwarves. There is nothing wrong with that. But they're orange. Orange dwarves with green hair. And there's only 20 of them making the world's supply of chocolate. None of this is meant to be realistic. But why make them dwarves? Why the green hair? Why make them orange in the first place? Can you see where I'm going with this? Kind of. What's wrong with the ordinary? It's for children. Ordinary's boring. Maybe? That's my original point about these children's writers. As if a little boy who shares a giant bed with his grandparents, four of them, as if in the real world he'd ever inherit this extraordinary chocolate empire. Yeah. In the real world, that fat German kid who falls into the chocolate lake at the beginning of the tour, in the real world, he's the winner. I think I might have to go. I've got See, a lot of work. See, this is how it really ends. He falls in, his father gets these big time lawyers to sue that shit out of Willy Wonka. They look into his shady past and his very dodgy personal life with those orange midgets. He's dragged through the tabloids, paedophilia ringing in his ears. They make shit out of him. Willy Wonka is no more. He's done. He's doing 25 years in a high security prison, being passed around his fellow prisoners like the proverbial box of Quality Street. On the outside, the Germans win, because, let's face it, the Germans always win. And that fat German kiddie, the one I was talking about... Oh, his about, name is Augustus. Right, Augustus. Well, he inherits everything as part of the settlement. He gets it all. And because he's such a fat gruffoo, he can't stop eating all the chocolate. The more the Oompa make, the more he eats. He's 18 years old and 40 stone. And one day he wakes up, stretches over for the television remote, dies of a massive coronary sclerosis. See, that's the real world. Do you understand this? Where exactly are you getting confused? It's only a children's story. It's a lie. What's the point? What are they telling us? What are who telling us? Our parents, the writers, Harry fucking Potter. In the real world, he's still under the stairs. He's a 30-year-old retard that's developed his own under-the-stairs language. The point is... Yes? The point is... Is that children don't want to read the true stories. What child wants to read the news? It's just escape. It's important that we dream of other things. Fuck off. Life's too short. If this world is going to evolve in any way, children need to be told what's happening. Clear, cold facts. That's what brought us down from the trees. That's what powers economy. A lot of these children's stories are metaphors. The writers are expressing important issues in creative ways. Expressing important... See, you're depressing me again. Fuck's sake. Do you think any eight-year-old finishing reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is thinking anything other than... Oh, I'd love a never-ending job stopper, Grandpa. Listen to me, John. It's Jack. They're trying to keep children young. Adults, publishers, fucking writers, they don't want children thinking for themselves. They see us as a threat. They want to keep everything fantasy. That J.K. Rowling woman. She's the enemy. She should be taken out. Erased. Removed. Exterminated. So that's what you're doing in a Harry Potter chat room. Trying to drum up some interest in an assassination attempt on J.K. Rowling. Well, are you interested? I can't. I have to do my geography homework.
I was younger then, and she just came on the scene, remember? Yeah. You're 10 years of age, and that is a critical age. You're starting to feel uncomfortable in your childishness. It's the hormones. And that video with her in her school uniform and pigtails. She looked lovely. You wanted to be her, didn't you? Did she have her tits done then? That was much later. Even so, they were a decent size. Certainly a B cup. But at the age of 10, you wanted to be her. And that video, wasn't it a bit creepy? In hindsight, that thing she was doing with her tongue, it was very sexual. We didn't notice. We were young, and it wasn't for the kiddies. It was for the older boys and the daddies. She's in her school uniform and pigtails, sticking out her tongue, but it's subtle, flicking it in and out like a little parrot. It was a bit seedy. So I'm watching that video, after not seeing it since I was ten, and I have to say, I felt betrayed by Britney. You know, all her songs about that journey from girl to woman. Yeah. And it sort of felt good, didn't it? Like, Britney Spears was a part of your puberty. I remember having my first period and listening to Not a girl, not yet a woman. And thinking, thanks Britney, my sentiments exactly. She felt like a spokeswoman. Oh, definitely. But as I watched, hit me baby one more time, and all that sexual stuff with her tongue and just how cropped that crop top was. Was her belly button pierced then? Probably. Sorry, go on. I got really angry over that betrayal. It's no longer Britney who's talking to us, but some pervert record producer. He's got this vision, this plan of turning every 10-year-old girl in the Western world into a tongue-flicking, crop-top, belly-button-pierced temptress. Have you got your belly-button pierced? Yeah, of course. Did it hurt? It's not as bad as you hear. But anyways, Brittany. Brittany. Yeah, Brittany. Don't you think a lot of young girls began to feel that betrayal? It's possible. Both of us did. And maybe that's why her career died a slow death. She lied to us. You don't think it has anything to do with her music being shit? A little bit. But I really would like to think that girls realise they're being manipulated, but they took a stand against pervert record producer. You know what the sad thing is? Britney got burnt. She was thick. She made her money, I suppose. She lost our respect. She got a few houses, nice clothes, new breasts. But if I met her tomorrow... Like on the bus? Or in Tesco? Or Topshop? Argos? Debenhams, maybe? If I met Britney Spears tomorrow, I would gently pull her to one side, put my arms around her shoulders like I'm going to hug her, move my face towards her like I'm going to kiss her, and whisper in her ear, Britney Spears, you sold my childhood soul! Oh, that's cruel. You sold my childhood soul, and then I'd smash her in the face. And what would Britney say? Hit me, baby, one more time. Of course. Her day of judgment will come when some teenage girl stops her outside Prada and says, You sold my childhood soul, bitch. <laughs> I better go. It's been nice talking to you. Whoever you are. Can we talk some more? I had an argument with my bitch mother and I'm feeling terrible. Okay. What do you want to talk about? Murder. And you really don't mind listening to this. That's what the room's all about. But you say if you did mind, if it was too draining, too annoying, too boring maybe. No, I don't mind listening. Maybe I shouldn't be even in this place. I don't know whether it's that serious yet. There isn't a scale of depression here. I'm here at the other end and I'm here to listen to you. So if you want to talk, Jim, then talk. If you don't, then don't talk. Right. Don't be nervous. I'll talk then. Okay.
I'm a Roman Catholic and it's last Easter and oh, and every year our parish does a big passion play in the local church. My mother's very active in the church. She's the Virgin Mary. Which would make you Jesus Christ. In the passion play she's the Virgin Mary. Uh, okay, right. And my whole family get involved. I've got three older brothers. They're Roman soldiers. They're very broad. Not like me. And they look the part. One year, my brother Derek, he went too heavy on Jesus and actually popped his knee right open. <sighs> it was a mess. But anyway, anyway, my mother runs into my bedroom with her terrific news. She's building up like she's going to tell me that I'm going to get a stab at playing a centurion. Until she tells me they want me to play John. Well, John's a great part. Yeah, but he's a bit gay. How do you mean? I've got nothing against gay people. St John was gay? Historically speaking, he probably wasn't gay. But in our parish, it's always the slightly effeminate boys who get to play John. Okay. Like I say, I've got nothing against gay people. I respect the gay community. They're tough. They know their own mind. They stand out and they don't care, you know? I respect them. But I'm not like that at all. I'm just a sap with no bottle who knows nothing. I'm not interesting enough to play the gay icon that is St. John. In a million years, I could never get away with those lime robes. <laughs> lime? <laughs> it's a sort of unspoken thing in the parish. It's a bit weird. Right, carry on. We do a few rehearsals with my mother as the Virgin Mary, and I've got to get emotional when Jesus is dying on the cross, and he says to Mary, Woman, behold your son, while looking over at me. And I'm supposed to break down that point because I know that Jesus is about to croak it. I'm getting all just blocked up because I know I'm a terrible actor. Emotionally blocked? Exactly. Right. Okay. So I tell my mother I want to drop out of the play. I say it quiet so the others can't hear. But she starts screaming at me and saying how typical it was. And did I have a backbone? And why was I such a coward? And all this shit. And why wasn't I like my older brothers? And then she says I'm like my dad. But what would I know? I haven't seen my dad since I was six. But she starts shouting. You're just like your dad, Jim. Just like your dad. Walking out on things. Walking out on me. Gutless. I mean, I just hate her then. Why did she have to bring up my dad in front of all those people like that? Why? So the following night is the Passion Play proper. And I'm kneeling there looking up at Jesus and he's doing a wonderful job. This guy called Nick Lawson. He's into amateur dramatics in a big way. I actually saw him in a production of Babes in the Woods. Playing uh, the Widow Twanky. I swear to God, he was hilarious. But as Jesus Christ, he was even better. Obviously not in a hilarious way, but... Yeah, I understand. Right. So Nick's lying to me and my mother is coming up. I'm still really furious with her from the night before. Woman, behold your son, cries Nick. At the start, I don't know whether it was his great delivery or just thinking about my mother being my mother. But I started to cry. I'm crying really hard. People are thinking that this is wonderful. I completely upstaged Nick's crucifixion and the night's suddenly all about St. John and whether he's going to be all right and whether he'll have the strength to carry on and finish his gospel. <sighs> but anyway, oh, anyway, <sighs> afterwards, and my mother is having a lemonade in the sacristy and I'm out in my lime robes looking over at her and I realise... Why was I crying back then? I was crying because I know my mother doesn't like me. If I really remind her of the man she hates, the man who left us when I was six, then maybe I should walk away too. But where to? Where do I go to? The rule in the room is that we don't give advice, we just listen. Okay. So what about you? Do you have anything you want to share? I just listen. No problems? 
Of course, but I prefer to listen to other people's. What do you get out of that? Not too sure. Knowing that there are other teenagers struggling probably makes you feel better about your own problems. No. These are very strange places, aren't they? Like I said, I don't know whether I should be here, whether it's that serious yet. What do you think? As I said, the rule in the room is The that... rule in the room is we don't give advice. Fine. Have you been to many suicide chat rooms? Yeah. And do they help you? Who said I needed to be helped? Can I know your real name? You can call me Laura. But is that your real name? Maybe. What city are you from? Look, it doesn't matter. None of it really matters. All you need to know is that someone is listening to you. That's enough, isn't it? I suppose. Will we talk about something else? No, I don't talk. You talk. I listen. Talk about what? Tell me about the day that your father went missing. We need to set rules. Why? We don't use our real names, we don't say what schools we're from. It's enough to know we're all from the same area. Just leave out the details. It gives us more freedom. Keeps it impersonal. I'll use William. I'll be Eva. I always use Jack. Emily. How do we know you're not two middle-aged men trying to get off chatting up two teenage girls? How do we know you're not two desperate housewives trying to take advantage of two innocent altar boys? Are you older boys? Are you desperate housewives? No. 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 <laughs> Excellent. I was an altar boy. Oh, fuck. No, I quite liked it. How? When you're seven, you've got a very simple idea of life. And for a while, dressed in my altar boy's gown every Sunday, I really thought I was some sort of angel. I called myself an angel waiter. Angel waiter. You see, I believed in Adam and Eve and that God created the world in six days and that he had a rest on the Sunday. And I had this image of the church being like a restaurant cafe for God to rest in. Or a McDonald's. Exactly. And it was my job as an angel waiter to serve him on his day off. So, what does God eat? Chicken nuggets. <laughs> I was only seven. That's very cute. How long did you think this? Several months. And the whole altar boy thing? Four years. Four years? Are you religious now? No, I'd rather not talk about religion. You either do or you don't believe. End of discussion. Dick. Rule 15, 16. We're all middle class kids of varying wealth growing up in and around Reading. I think we all know each other's views on boring issues like religion. All right. What's mine? You're disillusioned with the official church, yet you remain spiritual. You have to find your own religion based on the simple idea that people should be nice to each other. Bastard. It's a cliche. We're all cliches. Yeah, all people can be placed in little boxes like that. They can. So what are you? Pain in the arse. Apart from that. I'm a cynic. I'm an angry cynic. Very attractive. I'm not interested in being attractive. Why should I be? Because attractive people go further. Yeah, I think I glanced at that article in one of my sister's magazines. People see a cynic as a black hole. They're nothing. While a person who might be attractive or charming, well... They're at the very centre of things. 
changing things, manipulating events. What are you but a bad smell? That's very kind of you. You know what I mean. You think I'm heavy handed? You certainly sound that way. He's bloody opinionated. Well, that's the name of this room, isn't it? Redding's bloody opinionated. Christ. I'm at the age, we're all at the age, where we should stand up for something. I mean, to me, it's not about making friends and going bowling and sitting at McDonald's, bumming cigarettes, talking about the latest Harry Styles album. It's a waste of fucking time. Now's the time to be a pain in the ass, to step away from other people. We're teenagers. They used to mean something. It was about revolution. Now, aside from the punks, what have teenagers achieved in the last 50 years? Nothing. Did punks achieve something? They made their mark. They were angry and they showed it. My mother was a punk. We've got a photograph from 1979 and she's got a cold sore on her lip the size of a tennis ball. Quite amazing. It was dirty work being a punk. Nowadays, teenagers wouldn't go that far before cracking open their cleansers. Oh, definitely. I don't know about that. I cultivated a boil on my neck last year for a few weeks. When my mother brought me to the doctor, I was gutted when he said he wouldn't lance it for me. Ooh. But he gave me this little black plaster. It sort of draws the pus out towards the little hole. Do we have to talk about this? It's kind of disgusting. It's Redding's bloody opinionated. Not so Redding's... I'm watching television with my dad and my baby brother. And above the telly, I hear this noise. I swear to God, it hit the wall behind me. That's disgusting. But it was a revolution. How? My body was revolting. Oh, the comedy. But does anyone know what I'm talking about? Not really. Yeah, I do. Finally. I went on a climate march and for an hour or so I felt really good and I felt empowered. But it was just so small. In the great big scheme of my life, it was just an hour of saying that I believed in something. Oh, yeah. Oh, please. I suppose the rest of the time we're sleepwalking and waiting for something to happen instead of making something happen. It would be so great to accomplish something important. To have a cause. William wants to assassinate J.K. Rowling. <laughs> I was only joking. We talked about it for an hour last week in the Harry Potter chat room. It's not her personally, it's the idea of her. What she stands for. And what's that? William reckons children's writers simplify everything to keep children simple. They see us as a threat. Who do? Adults. It's like adults support these writers to write stories of fantasy so children have this cutesy, warped idea of what life's all about. So J.K. Rowling is the field marshal? She is the enemy. Not her, the idea of her. If I could kill the idea of her without her getting hurt, I'd do it tomorrow. Are you actually a lunatic? I just want to do something important. It's frustrating. Would you ever kill anything, William? No. Any idiot can kill something. Where's the glory in that? Aren't you meant to say that each life is sacred? Exactly. That's crap. There are some people... And life is just wasted on them. Dictators, terrorists, racists. P teachers. They don't do anything. They suck all the goodness out of living. Like William. Shut up. I think William just wants a cause. He wants to see that cause through. He wants to make a big statement. Yes, exactly. I want to make a big statement. Who doesn't? Thanks, Eve. It's Eva. Right, Eva. Is anyone there? Are people still awake? Is this room really called Reading's Bloody Opinionated? We don't use our real names, names of schools, any details. We all know we're from the same area and that's enough. Right. I'll be Jim then. Hello Jim. I'm Eva. Emily. Jack. I'm William. So what happens here? I don't know this place. What's up? Heated discussion, chit chat, bullshit. We're looking for a cause. William wants to make a statement. We're all a bit frustrated.
If you have any causes handy, feel free. Can we talk about our problems here? Oh, God. Have you got problems, Jim? Yeah, I do. Are they big problems? Well, I think so. Big to me, anyway. And you want us to listen to these problems and give you some advice? Jesus, William! Are you still there? Look, I'll go to another room if you want. Jim? Yes? We're here to help you. So I've been bullied all the way through primary and now in secondary school. I'm very skinny and a bit funny looking, so it goes with the territory. You expect it. But I have bigger worries, deeper worries that I can't really explain. And that's tricky. And very recently I've started to feel, what's the point? What's the point in everything? But not in a moany, teenage way. Your depression isn't pretension. How do you mean? You're genuinely depressed. 100% genuine. I'm not one of these people who keeps an altar Kurt Cobain or anything like that. I actually can't stand Nirvana. I don't need their music to feed my depression. I can happily do it all by myself. Obviously not happily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Happily is the wrong word. But you know what I mean. What does depression feel like? It feels great. What do you think? No. I know it's crap. I just want to know what it feels like to Jim. Well, Jim? It's like the whole world has turned into soup. Everything has a consistency of soup and your insides and your heart, they just sort of ache. And it's like you're clogged up with about five sliced loaves of bread exactly like that. Wow. Depression's like bread and soup. Shut up, Jack! I'm only repeating! The food comparison probably doesn't work. Schizophrenics often say they feel like a mixed salad. <laughs> <laughs> you seem nice. Do you have a girlfriend? Oh, wait a second. We're here to give Jim some advice. I just wondered, because he doesn't have anyone in his family he can talk to, maybe an understanding girlfriend would help him open up and... Oh, Jesus, Emily. If you'd been listening to Jim for the last hour, you wouldn't ask that. He doesn't have our normal teenage problems. It's not a problem that can be solved by a quick feel outside the chip shop. He's different. Of course he'd love a girlfriend, but that can't happen because he's dealing with getting up every morning and facing another one of his shitty days. I'm not that bad, I just... Maybe think, think before you speak, Emily. Piss off! No, it's just bullshit! I expected more from you. You didn't strike me as some head-in-the-sand princess. I'm not like that! Selfish cow. Jesus! All I said was, do you have a girlfriend? Jim has the courage to come into this room and open up and tell us all this pathetic crap. And all you're asked to do is imagine that others can be different from you. You have no idea what I'm like. Well, by a comment like that, like Jim could be cured by the heart of a good girl. I didn't mean it like that. Sorry about this, Jim. No, really, it's fine. I, I just think she's been... I think nice. we've all got a good impression of the type of girl you are, Emily. Fuck off! Living in a little suburban bubble, small group of girlfriends who hang out after music lessons, sniggering over some boy's Instagram. They're all called Sarah, right? Sarah Jane, Sarah Marie, Sarah Louise, Sarah Ann. The hairband brigade in your deck shoes and lacrosse shirts. What's the worst that's happened to you? Oh, come on, guys! Scuffed your ripped jeans in the park. That night, Daddy couldn't pick you up from Pizza Hut, so you had to get the bus home. Or maybe when your pony have to be put down because your big, fat, preppy ass was buckling its back. Oh, shut up, Jack. I had anorexia, you know. So what? 
weekend anorexia, was it? Bursting out of those ripped jeans. That's a shift a few pounds. What? Anorexia's a status symbol for your type of girl? You wear your six months anorexia like a badge of honour. You think it gives you an edge. It makes you a stereotype. And that's why when someone talks to you about their depression, you bat it aside with that shit about, if only you had a girlfriend, you'd be feeling a lot better. Christ! If we let you drone on, you'd be singing, cheer up, Charlie. Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. I hate that fucking film. Get out of here, Emily. We want people who are here for Jim. I'm here for Jim. Someone who understands his problems. Who gets the cause? What cause? What? So Jim is your cause now? We're here 100% 24-hour call. Jim's feeling cut up over something and we're here to listen and advise him. Understood? That's right. Don't need any chaff. Jim doesn't need some ex-anorexic pony rider whining little Katie Hopkins sound bites. Put simply... Piss off. <laughs> is she gone? Hardly matters. I thought we were supposed to be friends. Silly cow. Maybe she didn't mean what you think. There's no need to defend her, Jim. She's not needed. Anorexia's terrible. You shouldn't have said those things. Forget about her. She's debris. We're here for Jim. What about you, Jack? Yeah, I suppose. Wonderful vote of confidence there. Maybe a bit more conviction, funny man? Well, no offence, Jim. Well, your age? Shouldn't you be taking advice from a doctor, maybe? Christ, Jack! That's so fucking cruel! Don't you get it? He doesn't have anyone. We're it. Look, all I'm saying is that maybe he should- Jack! <sighs> Can we step into the Kardashian chat room? I want to talk to you in private. Okay. That was all a bit weird. Well, you don't have to worry about that now. Okay then. So, tell me about the day your father went missing. Well, it's quite important. Shouldn't I wait for the two boys to come back first? I'll get them my notes. Alright then. Right. Well, I'm six years old and my three brothers are going away for the weekend. A treat or something or other. My dad's staying behind and my mother says that he's got to look after me. Said it would be a chance for us to bond. So they're gone. And me and dad are looking at each other at the kitchen table for the first time, you know? He asks me what I want to do. And straight away, I want to go and see the penguins in the zoo. When I was six, I was going through some mad penguin obsession. I used to dress up as a penguin at dinner times and Always ask the fish fingers. Stuff like that. If it wasn't penguins, it was cowboys. Cowboys were cool. A penguin costumed as a cowboy was always a step too far, funnily enough. <laughs> oh, God. So we go to the zoo and I wear my cowboy outfit. Get my gun and my horse and my hat and all that. We get the bus and it's sort of funny to see my dad on a bus and away from the house. We start to have this chat about when I was born and what a really fat baby I was. But how after a week or so, I stopped eating any food and everyone was really worried that he was very worried. That he was so happy when I got better and they could take me home. We're in the zoo and I go straight to the penguins, standing in my cowboy gear, looking at the penguins, having such a great chat to my dad on the bus. It was a perfect childhood day. Uh-huh. He lets go of my hand and says he'll be back with my chalk ice. And he goes. He's gone. And I'm happy looking at the penguins, but it's an hour since he left and I go to look for him. I'm walking about the zoo and I'm not worried yet. I don't talk to anyone. And I leave the zoo... And I go to the bus stop we got off at earlier. I get on the bus. I tell the driver my address. He asks where my parents are. And I say they're at home waiting for me. 
I stand in the bus seat nearest the driver. <laughs> well, after a while, we end up at the end of our street, and the driver says, So long, cowboy. He was nice. I get the key from under the mat and open the door and go inside the house. And I'm alone there. I take off my cowboy clothes and hang up my hat and my holster. It being Saturday night, I have a bath and get into my pyjamas. Because my dad would have liked that. I have a glass of milk and some biscuits and watch Saturday Night Takeaway. Because that was his favourite programme on the telly. It's getting dark outside. And I start to worry. This house is feeling too big. So I get my quilt and I take it into the bathroom. And lock the bathroom door. And it feels safe with the door locked. So I, I stay in there. And he's not coming back. He, he, he's never coming back. I stay there for two days. It'll be a laugh. Right now, we're all he has. We're there for him 24-7. It'll be a blast. Eva gets it. Why can't you? He's our cause. Let him talk a bit. Mess him up. See how far he'll go. Are you there, Jack? Are you with the cause, Jack? Oh, Jack! What next? Spiral down, spiral down till you know no more. A lower middle class family with your mother having notions above her status, hence the extracurriculum activities, the rugby, the horse riding, the rowing classes, etc, etc, etc. At the age of four you realise that the children on your street laugh at your brothers for their aggressive social climbing. And the people in the rowing club laugh at them for wearing the pikiest clothes. Your first feelings of anxiety when you realise that you are living in a family hated by everyone and that you are one of them. Right. You decide to stay indoors, but being the youngest brother to brothers made on the rugby field, they adopt you as their plaything, and later, their punch bag. At the age of five, you go back outside to play with the other children. Only to see that the bonds of friendship have already been formed. And there is little room for a small, tubby, ugly toddler with an unhealthy obsession for penguins. You are all alone. But you do find a friend in, um... Timmy. Little Timmy Timmons. Yeah. A tiny six-year-old with severe bronchial problems who has to drag an oxygen canister behind him. When the other kids play road football... You watch Timmy's mother slap phlegm out of Timmy's chronic lungs and into a Tesco bag. Watching this, age six, you have your first thoughts of your own mortality. True. One momentous day, your father leaves you in the zoo, leaving the family in the shit. Your mother is forced into getting her very own job. She works at a petrol station, ending all her dreams of the posh life and throwing her into a depression eased only by... Gin and tonic. The tonic being... Valium. Your best friend Timmy dies. But not of the tragic weakening of his lungs in the middle of the night. But a speeding toy to Prius which flattens Timmy's trailing oxygen canister, leaving him walking zombie-like through the mean streets of Reading whilst the other children shout... Spaz boy! The day of Timmy's funeral you take your very first Valium. You are aged eight. Eight and a half. 
Eight and a half. You tried contacting your dad by placing leaflets on lampposts, but to no avail. You try to make friends with anyone you meet by ingratiating yourself to be whatever they want you to be. But to no avail. You retreat back into the indoors and your Neanderthal brothers' daily beatings. You hide yourself in books of the occult, which leads to a period of bedwetting. Is that important? Definitely. You briefly turn to religion and take part in the Passion Play, only to realise you hate Jesus Christ only slightly less than you hate your mother, the Virgin Mary. At 13, you watch your first porn, which only creates more of a distance between you and those girls you will never get to touch. You hate yourself. You decide to stop communicating with other people entirely. Your life is directionless. Jesus. The next two years are a sad cocktail made from homemade beer, the odd Valium, and the odd shot of whiskey. Your nights begin to take on a pattern of aggressive self-analysis until one night you find yourself talking to an American bloke who's planning on killing himself. His unfortunate name is Chad. Like Chad and the others in the suicide club, you reach a moment of recognition. You are searching for that elusive purpose. A purpose. Right. A purpose. Fuck. Fifteen years. It's so depressing. If it wasn't such a tragic life, it'd make a very funny musical. I don't think you've ever been given a chance. For some reason, you're always the one who gets burned. But why me? You can't take responsibility for what others have done to you or what other people think of you, Jim. The reasons why people have done these things isn't something you have control over. Why me is a pointless question. Stupid, even. Right. Sorry. What are you feeling right now? In this moment? That's what matters. Concentrate on that. But try and think more positive, for goodness sake. Oh, shut up, Jack! But fuck it, guys, all this talk of you telling Jack! No, this is just shit. You're just highlighting all the bullshit that's happened to Jim. Jim, listen to me. Things have been hard. I can see that. You don't care about Jim. Yes, I care! Why don't you tell him what you said to us earlier? What are you talking about? Be honest with him. Tell him. Tell him. Jack? What did you say, Jack? I told Jack about your dad and how he left you when you were a child, and Jack started laughing. What? From the outset, Jack's been saying that you sound like a spoiled little twat who needed a kick in the arse. You said that, Jack. No! He can't be trusted, Jim. He's one of those hard-working, lower-class types. He's not even from Reading. He's a Bracknell boy or something. The apple of his mother's eye. Makes out like he's everybody's friend. Really, he's a backstabbing bastard. Fuck off! Nothing worse than someone ashamed of their background. Is there, William? Some eager beaver effect to your voice to get on. Oh, Jesus! Sitting around the dinner table looking at the dumb faces and cringing at the stupid chit-chat of family life. Can't you see him? Little Lord Fontaroy of Berkshire. Stuck in his room, dreaming of escape. He feels this way about his own family, then friends must mean shit. He's got no friends. It's all virtual with Jack. Can't have people seeing him for what he really is. What does Jim mean to the superior Jack, I wonder? Some whinging twerp. Some middle-class quack. A gutless, gibbering child. One of life's morons. A spoilt imbecile. A mollycoddled spastic. Jim, please listen to me. Shut up, Jack. No, but this is just a bunch of- Jack, you worthless piece of shit. Why don't you take your spoiled elitist backside and fuck off back downstairs to an evening of Pringles and Sky One? Too good. Fuck it. So sorry you had to hear all that, Jim. And you seem like such a good person. I oh, know. And you think you know someone? Continue then, William. Jim. I'm listening. You have to focus on this anger that you're feeling and channel it into something that will get all those people in your past back. How do you mean? How do you think you could hurt your mother after all those years of neglect, all those years she treated you like you were nothing? Well, I've been fighting her for so long now and I just think... But she doesn't listen to you, does she? No, 
she doesn't and it doesn't make me feel any better so i've been thinking if she came into my room in the morning if i'd done something like maybe i've cut my wrists or taken pills or something i can imagine her face bitch she'd be crushed the guilt would kill her yeah, I suppose it would. But I don't know if I'm ready to do that. Jim. Yes. Me and Eva can't imagine what your life has really been like. It just seems so, so sad. And without hope, probably. But we've been giving up our time and listening to you over these last few nights, haven't we? Yeah. And thanks, lads. Really. I just want you to do one thing for me. Yeah, sure, William. Whatever it is. I want you to ask yourself two questions before you go to sleep tonight. Do you have a pen and paper so you can write these questions down? Um, yeah, go on. Why is it people treat me like I'm nothing? Why is it people treat me like I'm nothing? If no one cares about my life, why should I care? If no one cares about my life, why should I care? Oh, it's two o'clock in the morning and my mother's hoovering the stairs and landing. Tonight, my three idiot brothers Call me a freak for not wanting brown sauce on my quiche. I better go. Thanks, guys. Sweet dreams. He's ours. The rule in the room is that we don't give advice. He spoke about you. He spoke about this place. I can't help him. So, if you're not here for anything else, then I think you should just leave. But he might listen to you. If he's suicidal, the last thing that he needs is someone giving their half assed opinion. It doesn't help, believe me. It's not like that. He's being talked into doing something. I can't get involved. Look, all I do is sit here and listen to people my age that have these urges to hurt themselves. Most of the time, they don't do anything. A lot of the time, they just need to know that someone is listening to them. Because they either feel like they don't have anyone or they actually don't have anyone. That's all I do. But right now, the only people he has are two strangers who want to see him do something to himself. I don't go in other chat rooms anymore. There's too much shit that goes on, people get hurt. Exactly. Christ, are you still there? Laura, Laura, please. If you want to pass my email on to him, it's Laura. Oh, for fuck's sake, you don't have to talk if you don't want to. Just come and you'll see. If it gets too much, you can always get out. We'll be right there with you. But who are you? How do I know I can trust you? I started a mathematics club in school called the Broniacs. I've never so much looked at a boy. There's nothing I'd like more than to get out of this hideous body, to forget the difference between common and natural logarithms. Emily? To be able to surprise myself. Last night, I had a dream, and I swear to God I think I had my first orgasm. Today, in looking back over the details of the dream, all I can remember is Stephen Hawking asking me to change his batteries. Believe me, Laura. You can trust me. I am a trustworthy person. What we all need to do here is get our heads out of our asses and try and fucking do something. Are you there? As little babies, you can't do any wrong, can you, William? You're bloody perfect. All you do is eat, shit, laugh, cry, sleep, don't sleep, but you're loved. And I suppose you're loved because your parents have this blank page, don't they? And all their hopes can be projected onto this beautiful little blob. 
And the blob can't disappoint because it's only a beautiful little blob. Of course, that only lasts a few months until bang! Suddenly the blob's a little too hungry, a little too loud, a little less beautiful. Well, now it's a toddler and a character's forming. And it's only fair to be a bit more critical now it's a toddler. A little too quiet, too shy, too aggressive. Can't stop eating, a little too cranky. Blah, 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 blah. And before you know it, the toddler's ten years old. And let's say another baby's born. Oh, typical. A ten-year-old's a big mouth to feed. An ever-growing child disappoints, causes worry, sucks your money. And your parents' hopes are already on the next blob because at ten years old, a person is formed. A character's developed. The damage is done. It certainly was with me. Now imagine what a teenager means to its parents if a ten-year-old means this, Jim. We're not a child, not an adult. Not a girl, not yet a woman. Oh, Eva, please. Brittany speaks the truth. A teenager is a sub-person. Not that Brittany ever used the lyrics sub-person. With this hormonal mess. A boy, man, a girl, woman. We're like a bad experiment. So true. I've got to really thought it through. We'd be babies born on the Monday, fully grown adults by the Tuesday, because everything else in between is just a long list of bumblings, mistakes and bad skin. Oh, the bad skin. Teenage years. And the voice we have, William. What voice? Any voice that hasn't been shaped by some shit children's writer or some draining pop star. If we do have an original thought, it's just seen as a joke. It's a joke because the adults who have lived through these years remember them with complete and utter embarrassment. It's not that we're misunderstood. Or not understood at all. No. They completely understand us because they've lived through these years. They see it as their right. As their adult duty. To patronise us with the words, whatever you're going through, you'll get through it. Now clean that bloody bedroom, bitch. Your mother would use bitch. By 15, you realise that the individual doesn't mean shit. And the average teenager is just seen as a big, embarrassing joke. Or just folded up neatly and placed into a box marked, The Awkward Years. But if you allow yourself to be summed up that simply, from 15 onwards, you'll go through these different phases. You'll be summed up into little boxes until they place you in your final box and shove you in the ground. Guaranteed. Only a few teenagers make a stand. Only a few brave souls make a statement. Teenagers like you, Jim. Like me. Now, I was thinking that Jim's depression allows him to see things clearer than us. He's been neglected by his family and friends so that maybe that isolation perfectly represents the average teenager's plight. It's like he's expressing important issues in creative ways. It's a poetry. It's a metaphor, Eva. It's quite brilliant, Will. But you know, Jim, maybe the more public you made it, the more of a statement you'd be making. One excellent idea. How do you mean? Think of all those forgotten teenagers you'd be speaking for if you killed yourself publicly. You'd be a hero, a legend. Very brave. Very romantic. Sexy, even. Do it in public. I'm not too sure about that. Maybe show it over the internet then. Would it be easier in your bedroom? Yeah, I suppose. It sort of seems right that he remains alone, that people see him die like that. Well, it's stronger, isn't it? Definitely. Well, I'm used to you alone anyway, so... And for the past few weeks, I don't like being out in public places so much. It seems easier if I do it here. Can you get a webcam to live stream it? My brother Jonathan has one. Perfect. Of course he'd kill me if he found me using it. Well, we wouldn't want that to happen, would we? It sort of steals your thunder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Jim, this is Laura. And who are you? She's come in with us. I've spoken with Jim before. We know each other. You're a friend of his. Why exactly are you harassing him like that? We're here for Jim. Do you know what state he's in? I know he hasn't been feeling well. What? He hasn't been feeling good about himself. He's lonely. He feels detached. He's suicidal. He's ready to take his own life. Which is what you want. Oh, piss off, Jack. <sighs> Why is it that you're doing this? We're his friends. No, you're not. We didn't abandon him like you two. Jim came to us looking for advice and we've been making things clear for him. You're talking to him like there's no other options. You're making him believe that there is nothing else. That suicide is some romantic gesture. That one 15 year old's death will be held up by other 15 year olds. And celebrated for something. And will make a big statement for all those average trapped teenagers. If you think of yourself as some blob that's been moulded into an empty child and sent through life in a set pattern. If you think that, it will happen. It will happen. Choices have been made and choices will be made where you have no control. Your life is set. That's shit. Every moment in life there's possibilities. Bitch! The statement being made is yours. But what are you saying, William? That you've got power? That you're smart enough to take advantage of someone vulnerable and talk them into a corner where they might kill themselves? And this is some big joke to you two. Some big comedy. Because you can't see, Jim. It's easier. It's easier that you don't have to see a dead boy and imagine it like you read it in a book or something. It's easier than murder. Because Jim is faceless to you. But it's just like murder. In these rooms, words are power. And you and that bitch have all the right words, haven't you? Oh, Eva, come on. Fuck this. You've tried to kill yourself but chickened out, haven't you? You think I'm going to let Jim be lectured by some whinging coward like you? Some new age happy clappy princess? Jim has real problems. This isn't some competition about who's the most sad here. And if you need to know, you dick. I have tried to kill myself. I did slip my wrists. It did come from a very real place. But I'm happy that I'm alive. And some days are better than others in the future. It scares me. But I'm ready for the struggle. I like the struggle. I like it a lot more than being stuck in the ground, watching over my friends and family who I've ripped apart. I just stay alive and they can help me. There's always a life. You're one of them sad girls who hangs around in suicide chat rooms. Who just sits there. Like a black hole. All dumb and silent. Soaking up the sad stories. Wallowing in other people's pain. Well, what statement are you making, bitch? You talk about a life of possibilities, choice, love, happiness. But I bet you'd love nothing more than a world full of sad, morose 15-year-olds. Draining on about their pathetic lives. Why not support those who want to kill themselves? Why not allow them to do it? Because they're the front line, aren't they? The public face of our gloom. Printed in the papers, shown on the telly. They need our support to do the brave thing. Do the decent thing. To get rid of the chaff and become a true revolutionary teenager. So do the decent thing, you worthless cow. Next time, don't cry out to mummy and daddy. Just do it. Stop. I'm 15 and my life is mine to do with it as I please.
Five of us are from the same area. Tomorrow at one o'clock, I want you to be there at McDonald's or the Oracle. I want you to be there because I can't be in my bedroom anymore. Maybe I'll do it quietly, but I want you to see me do it. Jim, I'm still here if you want to talk. You know, I don't think I can listen to any more talking. Let's finish this. It's funny, but I slept well. Probably the best sleep I've had in months. I left the house with my bag full of stuff and there was no one there. My mother was working her shift in the petrol station and my brothers were at this American wrestling thing that was happening in our school. I got the bus and there was this man with his young son which got me thinking about me and dad and the zoo and the cowboy outfit and all that. It seemed appropriate that I would see them. Typical. In the bus, I started to think about all those thousands of teenagers who kill themselves every year. Somebody will be killing themselves right now, maybe. While a number of others would have had it all planned out. A lot of them are doing it because they're alone. And some of them are doing it because they're very ill. Or maybe they're sad because someone hurt them somehow. There are so many reasons to do it. And I started to think about the family and friends who were left behind and the regret that must eat them up. It's all so quiet and violent. I got off the bus and walked through the streets and imagined all the ghosts of the dead teenagers looking at me. And what were they thinking? And what would they say to me? It's like they all followed me down the high street and into McDonald's. And they watched me buy some chicken nuggets and a coke and find a table. And the angels see me taking out my camera. In this room, those angels are waiting for me. I don't see myself as anything other than me. I don't imagine what we're about to do is making a big statement or speaking out for millions of teenagers. I'm alone. I give the camera to this 10 year old boy to hold. I tell him to point it at me and the table. There's no question, but I've been very sad about things. There are probably like thousands of teenagers who get depressed every year. Surely it's good enough to know that someone is there for me and someone is listening. But the thing is, I had to grow up fast when my dad left, and it's as simple as that. Something that small can mess you up for a long time. And I can't understand why he's gone. When you're six and wearing a cowboy outfit and looking at penguins, you shouldn't be made to grow up so fast. But I was. And I tore myself up over it for years. But honestly, what can a child do? I just want my childhood back. Is everything all right now? Yeah. You? Yeah. Thanks for sending the video, Jim. It was good. It helped. Good. 
Will we talk about something, Laura? What will we talk about? Bunny rabbits. <laughs> so we're out in the field. I don't know if it's real, but I can see quite clear now. So back for our meal, just as home as I feel. No time to be late. Into the So roll me away Cause today is a day Building an empire on my own With nothing in my way With the sun on my face Who else could I take Into the When we're out in the field I can tell when it's real When I feel that I know you Into the